the scientific discussion of X3. So this is detailed on the, on the website where uh, we make multiple references. And the reason in scientific papers that multiple references are made, and sometimes you scroll to the bottom of the scientific paper and you see hundreds of references, it's because all of these things interrelate. So when somebody looks at one of the observations we've made or one of the references and pulls a sentence out of one study and says, well, X3 is not this. Well, right, that's why we reference multiple studies. So these things all relate together. <clears throat> so when, uh, let, me, let me go back and talk about the history. So I had been observing as I'm a bone density researcher and I developed uh, some machines, some devices that stimulate bone density. Uh, what I was doing was loading the human body at optimized ranges of motion. So where humans naturally absorb high impact. So like in the upper body about right here, where there's a 120 degree angle of inclusion right here, delivering force here, same mathematics, same geometry and other joints of the body and seeing very aggressive bone growth as a result of loading those positions. I was made aware of what was going on at Westside Barbell, uh, which is a small gym in Ohio that had broken more than 140 world records using variable resistance. And I thought, okay, so they're doing loading at the bottom and then doing kind of a hyper loading at the top by using bands with weights. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting. It's a kind of a similar line of logic to what I'm working on. Then. Uh, in 2008, uh, Professor Anderson and researchers uh, published a study that was a look at the results that were taken from a group of individuals. So they took the Cornell athletes uh, from all sorts of different sports. It was a big study and they did ha half of them did their regular training protocol. The other half did the variable resistance protocol. So they used actually lower amount of weight than they would normally lift. And then they added bands, so it was hyperloading at the top, more than they could handle at the bottom normally, and then a lower load at the bottom. So it's really important to point out that there was a curve to this loading. They may have been handling X at the bottom and 1.3X at the top, but the point is they used a variance. Now, the results in that study showed two to three times the amount of strength gained in the period of time, it was 24 weeks, versus the control, very profound. Now, this was the verification of what Westside Barbell had been doing, and fantastic, and there's, there's uh, observations that have been made with chains and bands and all kinds of ways to vary the resistance. But then, I took my medical device, and uh, there was a study done in London, uh, at a hospital in London, and we were looking at postmenopausal females. So these are not athletes. These are actually deconditioned postmenopausal females. And something really amazing was, was brought to light, which was we were loading these women with seven, eight, nine times their body weight through their hip. So take your body weight and multiply it by eight. Incredible force. Weightlifters, professional weightlifters don't use that kind of, kind of weight. And these were deconditioned women. So now they built up to that over, over a, a six month period of time, but it was amazing what they were capable of. And that was the whole objective behind compression of bone and bone growth. Now, and that's what also happens in high impact. So when I looked at the, I came home back to the States and I, and I looked at the level of loading that they were using and then looked at the level of loading that the American College of Sports Medicine has in most of their documentation, uh, the levels of loading that non-athletic versus athletic people deal with with their lower extremities. And it was 1.3 to 1.53 in multiples of body weight. So this tells us that there's a seven-fold difference just based on those two data sets. Now populations, athletes, we're not looking at that, but Ultimately, 1.3 to 1.53 versus, let's say on average, 8.5, I think it ended up being 8.7 multiples body weight. That's a seven fold difference. So that made me look at the Anderson study and say, all right, well, this whole idea of X here and 1.3 X here is barely scratching the surface 
of what we may actually be capable of with stimulating muscular growth. What we really need is a lower weight here where our joints are compromised and a far higher weight here. Not only can we go higher in repetitions, we can fatigue multiple ranges of motion, something you cannot do with a static weight. So you go to fatigue here with a high weight, then when you can't hit that, you can go to fatigue at a medium weight, then at the end of your set where you can barely move, you go to fatigue here in really short repetitions with an even lower weight, really easy on the joints, and the amount of fatigue that goes through the muscle is far beyond what you would get with any sort of static weight system. Also, the amount of force, and this is a question that we get, uh, it's just bands, or I don't understand, I can get a band for, for uh, $40 at Walmart. I want you to look at this block of solid latex. This is one of the heavier bands. That's how much weight you're moving. That, that would, add for, for a, a six foot tall person, that ends up being about a 250 pound chest press at peak. You go to fatigue there for a few repetitions, which normally people don't handle uh, very many repetitions. The average person handle very many repetitions at 250 pounds. And then you diminish the range. So all these things, all these studies interrelate to make the rationale behind X3. One clarification. So the study that was done in London where we exposed the very high loads to the, the lower, lower body kinetic chain. These women weren't squatting seven, eight, nine times their body weight. The load was just exposed in the impact ready position. So like I said, 120 degree angle of inclusion right there. That's if you're trip and fall, that's how you absorb the force. So these were bone compressive movements in the optimized range of motion, the impact ready range of motion. So this was to stimulate bone density growth. But the clarity that it gave me to develop X3 was that we are really missing out on so many triggers for growth by not looking at the massive difference between our capability in the strong range and the capability in the weak range. And ultimately, if you look at human movement, if you look at sprinters, they have 180 degrees available in their knee joint but they only use seven degrees when they fire off their toe and move forward. So why is that? That's the optimized range of motion. We use the optimized range of motion all the time to absorb or produce great amount of forces, far heavier than we could ever lift. Now, if we use variable resistance, if we double down on the variance of resistance, and maybe for some, forget about the weights, we have growth potential that we've never tapped.